In this video, we'll talk about the Invertible Matrix Theorem. This theorem really ties up all of the concepts from the last couple of chapters and characterizes the various conditions under which a matrix can be invertible. So here's the statement of the theorem. It says if we have an n by n matrix, then all of the following statements are equivalent. So we have 12 statements listed here, and what the theorem says is that all 12 of these statements are true about a particular matrix, or all 12 of these statements are false about a particular matrix. So if any one of these statements is true, then what the theorem would say is that all of the rest of the statements would be true. And if any one of these statements is false, then the theorem says that all of the other 11 statements are also false. So how would we go about proving such a monumental theorem? Well, when we have an if and only if statement, when we prove that p if and only if q, where p and q you can think of as just being statements that are either true or false, then as we've seen, we've proven several theorems like that. We have to prove that if p is true, then q is true, and we have to prove that if q is true, then p is true. And that proves that p and q are equivalent statements. So here, when we have 12 statements that we want to prove are all equivalent, we have to prove that if any one of them is true, then all the others are true. And the way that we're going to do that is by proving several if-then statements, but the if-then statements are going to give us what we call implication chains. And these implication chains, if you can think of an if p then q as being an arrow, then basically what we're going to be able to prove is that we have an arrow that points perhaps along several steps from any one of the 12 statements to any of the other 12 statements. So for example, let's just take the five statements A, B, C, D, and J. What we're going to prove is the circular chain that you see over here. We're going to prove that if A is true, then J is true, which we indicate by writing an arrow from A to J. Then we're going to prove that if J is true, then D is true, so the arrow from J to D, then D to C, B, C to B, and then B to A. And because we have this circular chain now, this is going to prove that we can get from any one of these five statements to any of the other five statements. So for example, if we happen to know that D was true, then the implication chains would then prove that, for example, A is true, because we can follow the arrows around the circle. Now this won't complete the proof of the entire invertible matrix theorem, but we're going to have several small pieces like this. So, and all together, all of these different chains that we prove will ultimately give us the equivalence for all 12 statements. So if we're going to prove this chain here in the circular diagram, we have five if-then statements to prove. And we're going to start by proving that if A is true, then J is true. So A says that the matrix capital A is invertible. And J says that there's an n by n matrix C such that C times A is the identity matrix. But all we need there is to use the inverse matrix A inverse in for that matrix C, because A inverse times A really does equal the n by n identity matrix. Next up, we're going to prove that j implies d. So we're going to suppose that j is true. So now we know that there's this matrix C, such that C times a is the identity, and we want to prove that the equation ax equals 0 has only the trivial solution. So to prove that it has only the trivial solution, we let u be a solution to that equation. That just means that a times u is 0. And then we're going to take that equation, a u equals 0, and multiply both sides by c. On the left-hand side, that gives us CAU, and on the right-hand side, that gives us C0. doesn't matter what matrix C is. If we take that matrix and multiply it by the zero vector, we get the zero vector. And CA, that's the identity, and the identity times U is U, and that proves that U equals zero, which is what we wanted. Next up, we want to prove that D implies C. So D says that the equation AX equals zero has only the trivial solution, and C says that the matrix A has N pivot solutions. So we're going to suppose that D is true, which means now we know that AX equals 0 has only the trivial solution. And now think about what that augmented matrix would look like. Because that equation has only the trivial solution, that means that we can't have any free variables. If we had any free variables in that augmented matrix, that would give us extra non-trivial solutions. And that tells us that the matrix A has n pivot positions. For C implies B, we suppose that C is true. So now we know that the matrix has n pivot positions. And since the matrix is n by n, that means there's a pivot in every row, and therefore a pivot in every column. And since there's a pivot in every row and every column, when we row reduce that to its reduced row echelon form, that looks exactly like the identity matrix, and that's what B says. Finally, we want to close the loop and prove that B implies A, 
but B says that the matrix is row equivalent to the identity matrix. And if we know that, then in the previous section when we talked about invertible matrices, that exactly tells us that the matrix A is invertible. Because as we saw, when we take the augmented matrix AI and row reduce it to I, then the second half of that matrix gives us A inverse. That proof from the previous section proves that B implies A. All right, so now we know that A, B, C, D, and J are all equivalent. So now we need to link the other letters from the theorem into this chain of equivalences. So we're going to prove another circle. This one's a little bit smaller. This just proves that A is equivalent to K and G. And that will, once we prove that those three if-thens that we have down here, that will prove that K and G are equivalent to the five that we already worked with. So first we're going to prove that A implies K. So we suppose that A is true, so we know that A is invertible, capital A is invertible, and letter K says that we have a matrix D such that A times D is the identity. But again, just like we did earlier, we're just going to put in the inverse of A into that spot, and so A inverse is going to be the D that we're looking for. Now for K implies G, we assume that we have that matrix capital D such that AD is the identity matrix, and we want to make sure that we can always solve the equation ax equals b. So we want that equation to have a solution for every b, so we suppose that someone handed us a vector b. Now the identity times b, that's the same as b, and since ad equals the identity, we replace the identity matrix with ad. So we have adb equals b, but if we draw the parentheses, remember we have this kind of associativity that lets us regroup, so db, that is a solution to ax equals b, because a times db is b. Finally, for g implies a, now we know that ax equals b is consistent for all b. It has a solution for all b. So in particular, if we put the ith standard basis vector there, then ax equals ei is going to have a solution, call it ui, for each i between 1 and n. So for every column of the identity matrix, ax equals that column has a solution. And if we build a matrix using those solutions, then a times that matrix in each individual column will get the eis, and so that will give us our identity matrix. Written out a little bit more, a times the matrix u1, u2, and so on, that's going to be the matrix a, u1, a, u2, a, U, N. Remember, that's how we define matrix multiplication, but that's E1, E2, E, N, and that's the identity matrix. So this matrix here, whose columns are the U's, we call that capital D, and that gives us our solution. Now, so far, what we have are A, B, C, D, and J, and now by what we just did, K and G, all of those are equivalent. That's what we have so far. But now G, H, and I, if we look at these three statements, the equation AX equals B is consistent for all B, the columns of the matrix A span Rn, and the linear transformation T of X equals AX is onto, all three of those statements are the same, and we proved that back when we talked about linear transformations, and we talked about them being one-to-one -one and onto, we said that these were three equivalent ways to talk about what it meant for a transformation to be one-to-one -one and onto. And since G is one of the seven statements that we have so far being equivalent, now we know that H and I are equivalent to G, and therefore equivalent to everything else. So we can add H and I onto this list. But we also proved that D, E, and F are all equivalent. Those are three different ways to talk about what it means for a linear transformation to be one-to-one. -one. So we have D saying the equation AX equals zero has only the trivial solution, E says the columns of A are linearly independent, and F says the linear transformation is one-to-one. -one. And those are all equivalent, and again, we proved those in the facts about linear transformations. So where are we at now? We have A, B, C, D, and J. We added K and G to that list. We added H and I to that list on the previous slide. And now, since D is equivalent to E and F, we're adding E and F onto that slide. And if you look through those letters, they're a little bit jumbled up right now, but the only one that's missing is L, the 12th statement from the original theorem. But L is equivalent to little a, because Letter A says the matrix capital A is invertible, L says the matrix A transpose is invertible, and we saw that the inverse of the transpose is the transpose of the inverse, and that proves that A and L are equivalent. So here's the full theorem one more time, 
And again, the way we're going to use this is however we need to in any given situation. So if we're focusing on linear transformations, we might use F or I to talk about whether the linear transformation is one-to-one -one or onto. And that would then tell us that the corresponding matrix is invertible. If we're row reducing our matrix and we find that it has n pivot positions, then that might be how we determine that our matrix is invertible. Another way we can use this theorem is if we already know that the matrix is invertible, then we know all of the rest of these facts about the various related situations. One other nice consequence of the invertible matrix theorem is that if you ever have the product of two matrices being the identity matrix, then both of those matrices are invertible and each matrix is the inverse of the other. In other words, we don't have anything like a one-sided inverse. So before, when we were talking about the definitions, you could imagine, well, could it be that a, b equals i, but there is no matrix c such that c times a equals i. In other words, so we could ask this question, could it be that this happens, where A has an inverse that works on the right side of A, but it doesn't work on the left side of A. Or, if AB equals I, does BA have to equal I? In other words, could you have an inverse that works on one side, but not on the other side? And the invertible matrix theorem answers both of these questions. So could it be that A has an inverse that works on the right, but not on the left? No. If a b equals i, does b a have to also be i? Yes. So all of that comes out of the invertible matrix theorem, and it answers those questions in a nice way. You could imagine that these would be questions that we could have had, and now we have answers to those questions.